While Jesus was on the mountain in transfigured glory, nine of his disciples were in the valley below. There they faced a distracting crowd, detracting critics, a demon-possessed child, and a distraught and despairing father. And Jesus was nowhere to be found. As I consider that scene, I am reminded of the church today. We live in a world in which there are many critical people who show up and who look at us and who point at us and say, you know, what, look, you, look at their failures. We are confronted with people who have hurts and are filled with things that bring harm into their lives. And so often like these disciples in Mark chapter 9, it seems that we fail to be able to do anything for them. And like the disciples in Mark chapter 9, Jesus seems to be absent when we need his power. Not only mean he's spiritually absent, but we don't physically see him in our presence as he's been seated at the right hand of his father for nearly 20 centuries. And as we look at the failures in this story, which are failures of faith, I'm reminded that I believe one of the greatest privileges that we can receive in the life of our church and one of the greatest privileges that you can receive in your individual Christian life is to fail. Because failure can bring a wonderful learning opportunity into our lives. Failure will do one of two things for you. It will either make you bitter or it will make you better. It will either make you bitter or it will make you better. And hopefully by failing, you will grow in faith. I want to talk to you this morning about how to unseat your unbelief. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 Mark tells us, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And he often has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. And some manuscripts say, and fasting. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, and as we examine this story, we find the cause of our powerlessness. We're going to look at really the two, look, two uh, main aspects, the two main ideas this morning are the 
cause of our powerlessness and the cure for our powerlessness. Now, as we look at this and we think about our failures as a church and our failures as Christians, we find, first of all, look at uh, what is the cause? What is the reason why we so often fail to be able to accomplish what it is that we aspire to do in ministering to others and in overcoming sin and struggles in our own life? And, and as we look at and understand what the cause is, it's clear, as Mark says, that the first is that we forget our dependency. The first problem, uh, is that the, the reason that this is caused is by forgetting your dependency. As Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and as he saw his nine disciples surrounded by this crowd, uh, this noisy crowd, and these scribes who'd come up just to point their finger and say, we knew that you could not do this, he finds out, he tries to ask, what's going on here? And this man steps up from the crowd, and we immediately says in verses 17 and 18, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. All those words ring in our ears. They could not. Much like the church today, there is a ministry to be performed. There is work to be done, and we seem like we are unable to accomplish it. Here, this young boy is demon-possessed. He has symptoms that sound like epilepsy. Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, in the parallel account of the first gospel, Matthew tells us that he did have epilepsy. By the way, that does not mean that Mark was primitive and that he thought that every disease was the cause of demon possession. No, he understood. Sometimes we don't always understand. Some diseases are just as demons. Sometimes, excuse me, some diseases are just diseases. Some things are just the result of demon possession. But he says here that it was a demon possession which inflicted an actual disease upon this boy. But really the problem here, the focus is not the condition of the boy. It is the condition of the disciples here because it is said that they could not when he was at, when they were asked to cast out this demon. And we look at this, and, and we can see that, that uh, they couldn't cast it out. And we ask, why couldn't they cast out this demon? Over in verses 28 and 29, the end of the story, that they asked Jesus privately about that. And Jesus tells them that the reason they couldn't cast out this demon is because they had failed to pray. They had failed to pray. And I, I wonder if their earlier successes had caused them to fail in this moment. Earlier in Mark chapter 6, we find that Jesus sends his disciples out on a mission and they go out and they begin to preach and they cast out demons, and they heal the sick, and they were successful. They were sent out under the authority of Jesus. In this case, they failed to do what they had earlier been able to do with ease. Perhaps they thought that their initial success meant that every time they tried in the future, they likewise would succeed. And I believe that often in life we fail and our, we find ourselves powerless because we forget that we are dependent upon God. And we think that just because we've done something in the past, that means that we can always do it in the future. Oh, God has done some incredible things here at Emmanuel Baptist Church in our over 100 years of history. And I've heard about the hundreds of people, literally, who've been one to Christ at some years. And, and the ways that we've done things. And I, I spoke with uh, a pastor who had been here before when I was considering, considering the calling. And he shared with me some of the revivals that took place. And uh, we believe that if God has done it in the past, he can do it again. But he'll only do it again when we are dependent upon him. And we're thankful for what God has done already in this last year and, and how God is moving. But we realize this, it's all because of God and it's all because of our dependency upon him because he provides the power for effective ministry. Apart from him, we are powerless. The same thing said of these disciples could be said of so many churches, but they could not. Our apathy and material blessings, I believe, have very often caused us to fail to be spiritually dependent upon our all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent God. Henry Nguyen said, we have fallen into the temptation of separating ministry from spirituality, service from prayer. Our demons say we are too busy to pray. We have too many needs to attend to, too many people to respond to, too many wounds to heal. We think prayer is a luxury Something we do with a free hour or when we have a vacation from work to go on a retreat somewhere. 
But prayer is to be the heartbeat of our church. It's to be the heartbeat of your everyday Christian life. Unbelief will cause you to neglect prayer and to forget your dependency on God. You know, there's another cause that we look at this and when they forget their dependency, look at how the father of the boy, he brings his son to Jesus. He brings his son because he wants to see Jesus and instead of meeting the master, he meets his messengers. Instead of seeing the teacher, he gets the disciples. And the disciples' failure called, caused the faith of the father in Jesus to fail. It's a reminder to us that when people come through the doors of this worship center, they're not looking to hear David Crowther. They're not looking to find out about Emmanuel Baptist Church. When hurting people come through the doors of this sanctuary, into this place of worship, they want to experience Jesus Christ. It's not about us. We can all need to be egocentric. We don't need to be self-focused. They're coming here because they want to see Jesus. They want to know, will Jesus work in my life? And if we fail, it reflects poorly on our master. So I look around, you think about this city in particular. Here in Wichita, you don't have to go very far at all to see people who are disenfranchised, who are down and out, who've been pushed to the margins of society. Sometimes it's because of their own choices. Sometimes it's not. But very often, where do they congregate? They congregate even outside the doors of our church and other downtown churches. You ride across this country and see the great cathedrals and churches and all around the world, and you'll find outside the doorsteps the homeless, the hurting, the helpless. And why do people gather outside places of worship? I believe they gather because so often they believe that inside that building represents a hope that can help them. Maybe they're not even conscious of it. Maybe they're not even aware of it. But they come to us asking, can you help us? And may it never be said of us, but they could not the Lord has even impressed upon my heart in the study of this message the need that we do more ministry for those that are on the margins here in Wichita in the name of Jesus Christ, that we take the gospel. I'm thankful for what we're already doing. I believe we can do a whole lot more. And I believe we need to be reaching out specifically to minister, not just to the homeless, not just to the drug addict, but to those who are in need, whether that be through Divorce, whether that be through broken home, through addiction, whatever it might be. But if we're going to effectively do that, we must do exactly what these disciples failed to do. We must be dependent upon God for the power to do it. We cannot do it mechanically. We cannot do it automatically. We cannot do it uh, without uh, constantly and re continually reminding ourselves that this is not a ritual. This is something we do in dependence upon him. I heard a pastor tell not long ago of how when he first started out in his first pastorate that a man came down the aisle one Sunday and gave his life to Christ. A young man who came out of a life of alcoholism and addiction. And he said the man who gave his life to Christ or so he thought and he began to get involved in the life of the church. He said but it didn't take long until he began to become absent at their Bible studies then on Sunday morning, he'd look, and the man was there less and less frequent. Finally, he quit coming all together, and the pastor went by to visit with him. And he said that the young man said, Pastor, I appreciate you and everything, but the people down at Alcoholics Anonymous do a whole lot for me than your church has ever done. We find that sometimes that we're called to do ministry, to cast out the demons that hurt and bring harm, and we could not. If 
If we don't do this ministry in the power of Jesus Christ with absolute and utter dependence upon him, I'm afraid that we will become not only like these disciples, but we'll become like Samson who said, I will go out as before as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Well, we need to make sure that we don't forget our dependency. And we also need to make sure that we don't forget Uh, We don't focus on our doubts. So that's the other cause of powerlessness is focusing on doubts. The demons had complete control over the boy. And when the boy sees Jesus, or the demons looking through this boy's eyes see him, he he falls to the ground, he begins to convulse and and foam at the mouth. Jesus asked the question in verse 21a, the first part there, he says, how long has this been going on? How long has this been happening? father said his entire life since childhood very often in life when we struggle with a problem the longer we struggle with that problem the longer it goes on in your life the more hopeless it becomes the longer you've been praying for your child to overcome addiction The longer you've been been praying for that loved one to receive Christ as Savior, the longer that you've been asking God to heal you of your health problems, the more you think there's no hope. The more you think that it's futile. And so here it is with his father, and he thinks it's never going to happen, and he sees that his son is tottering on the brink of destruction. That's why he says that very often he falls into the water or falls into the fire. And it's a reminder that when sin uh, it reaches a person's life and when Satan is at work, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy my life. He wants to destroy the lives of every person he can come in contact with. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes but to steal and kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Like many parents who feel the pain of this father as they watch their child face the demon of anorexia and abuse and addiction and cutting and they just don't see much hope it's gone on so long that it just feels hopeless and then the disciples failure has cast doubt on the father's faith in jesus that's why like a lot of people he comes to jesus and he wants Jesus to help him, but really deep down, he doesn't think Jesus can do anything for him. That's why he says, but if you can do anything, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Man was just really making a last ditch effort to get Jesus to help him. He's been disappointed so often. He's been disappointed like many by their parents. Say, well, my parents weren't the people I thought they were. My Friends weren't the people that I thought they were. My spouse has disappointed me. My doctor has, been, has failed to be able to help me. And he just kind of felt like the problems were so big and had gone on so long that it was hopeless. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that way about some situation in your life that has been going on for so long? You've tried so many times that it's just hopeless and you're helpless some sin in your life as a Christian that you've prayed about and you've asked God to help you with, but you just kind of got the point, you don't think that God's never going to help you overcome that problem. We just kind of say like this father, if, if you can do anything for me. You know, a lot of Christians, they pray, Lord, if it be your will. There's nothing wrong with praying if it be the Lord's will, but so often this is kind of our excuse to express our doubt. Lord, if it be your will, because we don't think it is. Lord, if it be your will, because I don't think you're actually going to do this, if you can do anything. And Jesus will not tolerate our doubt. He says, if, 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 if I can do anything. He says, I'm not going to give you what you need if you will not give me your faith. Jesus will not tolerate a a wavering commitment. You know, if, if you're going to your surgeon and, and you're going in for surgery and you begin to tell him, you know, I, I really don't think you're the doctor for me. If, if you think you can do this, if you think you can perform a surgery, 
You go ahead and do it. Well, you know, he's probably going to tell you, if you don't have confidence in me as a surgeon, you need to find another doctor. Some time ago, once I was, I was serving at a church, and a, and a man called. He wanted to come by and visit with me. He said it was an emergency, and he came by my office, and, and he did not attend the church, but he came in. He was looking for someone to do some counseling for he and his wife. He said it's an emergency situation. They came in, and, uh, and I spent an hour and a half or so with them talking, and after they left, he called me back, and he said, hey, I just want to ask you, he said, what kind of credentials do you have in psychology? He began to question about how qualified I was to counsel with him. And he said that they found another counselor, that uh, she's a fa- licensed family counselor and all these various things. So I said, hey, that's great. By the way, it didn't hurt my feelings because I, I realized there are a lot of people a lot more qualified to counsel than I am. But, but he went and he visited with her and then he called me back after she charged him $120 an hour and wanted to come back and talk with me again. <laughs> and I hate to tell you, I really didn't have a whole lot of time for him anymore. Because if he didn't have confidence in me, I couldn't help him. And when we don't have confidence in Christ, he can't help us. But, but when Jesus says, if, if, what he's saying is that, is there anything that's impossible with God? Is the arm of the Lord too short to help you? Can God, is there anything that he would fail to do? Is he too weak? Is there anything too great for him? Paul says, No. Paul says that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. We have to trust that he is absolutely powerful. We cannot forget our dependency upon him. We cannot focus on our doubts instead of on his dominion. Finally, though, we need to think about the cause of our powerlessness, but there's a cure for it. Thank the Lord. How do we receive the power of Christ in our lives to bring about change and to do effective ministry? How can we receive the power of Christ to do only what only he can do? Well, it's very clear to us in this verse that we, first of all, have to push forward in faith. We push forward in faith. When Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. This father of this child melts in tears. I mean, he's just crushed because when Jesus, when he says, if, the man realizes that he hasn't come. With, sure, with full assurance. He says, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Well, it's one of the most honest expressions of faith. The most human expressions of confidence in all of God's word. It's important in our Christian life that we are able to be honest with God. Sometimes we like to say things. We don't want to say that we don't believe. We don't want to admit that we're struggling. But God can handle it. God already knows it. You might as well tell him. I was preaching this, pre- preaching a message, not this one, but I, I quoted this passage. In a church where I was serving once, and this man came to me, and he called me after the service. He said, uh, Pastor, he, he was just visiting. He, he had been there to attend something for his family. And he heard me quote Mark chapter 9, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And he, he called me. He said, Pastor, I've got a terminal illness. There's no cure for this illness. And, and I'm struggling. I want you to come talk to me. So I went and I sat with him there in his living room. And he shared with me. He said, I, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. But I just keep wondering in my mind, I know I'm going to die. Am am I really right with God? Am I really going to go to heaven? I I just don't feel like I've lived a good enough life. I began to remind him of what the gospel says. It's not about our life. It's about his death. He said, I know that. I know that. But I still just keep questioning if I've lived a good enough life. And I kept pointing back to this. I said, you know, we're all going to have questions. We're always going to have questions lingering doubts in our mind but we have to come to the place where we say like this man lord i believe i believe help my unbelief because there's a mixture of faith and unfaithfulness in all of us i believe what we're called to do is to express the faith that we do have not the doubts that we have we have to look past our fear and our unbelief, and we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Although this 
man lacked a great amount of faith. He put the faith that he had in Jesus Christ. And I believe that what he was doing here was expressing in his heart, when he said, Lord, I believe, he was expressing in his heart what he had trouble with in his head. Because you're not going to have every T crossed and every I dotted in your mind. There are always going to be things that you struggle with, even doubts that you struggle with. And you're going to always have those questions. But this man here, he looked at Jesus and he made a mad scramble in faith to get through the door of unanswered prayer. And he made an humble and honest admission of his inadequacy that God would work in his life in spite of himself. Do you need God to work in your life in spite of you? I need him to work in my life in spite of me. James chapter 1 verse 6 talks about how we pray in faith without any doubting. And that terrifies me sometimes because I think in my own mind about how often I have these doubts. I'll pray something, I'll believe it and get in confidence, and then I'll ask myself if I really believe it. The encouraging thing to me about the book of James that talks about this idea of wavering in faith is that Abraham is the example of faith. And before we get too confident about Abraham, just rem- I cannot remind you that he didn't always have a lot of faith. He had to lie when he didn't believe that God would protect him. Oh, she's my sister, not my wife. When God said, you're going to have children through this woman, he said, well, somehow I can find me a, we've got to find a surrogate mother. There were moments of unfaithfulness and disbelief in Abraham's life but if you look at the trajectory of his life he was one who said I believe God and despite the heartaches of my life despite the years of disappointment in my life I'm going to continue to walk forward in faith like this man we have to push forward in faith saying Lord I believe help my unbelief he didn't wallow in his unbelief he didn't wallow in his uh, questions he said lord i believe this is a sin to be confessed and this is something i'm repenting of and i'm not going to draw a line in the sand and say this is my faith and i'm not going to step over this line no he says i'm willing to go a little further i'm willing to be honest with god i'm willing to ask him to forgive me for when i fail to believe and i'm going to say i will be fearful but i'm not going to be faithless You have to be willing to risk stepping forward in faith. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, if you cannot go as far as you would like, go as far as you can and ask Christ to help you go further in faith. When he found that he began to push forward in faith, he found the cure for his powerlessness. The disciples learned the cure for powerlessness. And we find that verse 26 tells us that the boy left the demon and though he appeared dead for a moment, it's often in a life that Our problems get worse before they get better. It says, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Oh, we have to push forward in faith. There's something else we have to pray full of faith. Verse 28, we find that the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast it out? They want to know why they failed. Like I said before, they tried in the past and they had succeeded, but victory in the past is no guarantee of victory in the present. We've got to keep moving forward. Now, when Jesus says this kind, this kind of demon, he's not talking about a special class of demons. He's talking about any spiritual issue that's just difficult. And the lesson for the disciples is that we cannot confront spiritual issues in our own power. He says, but it is with prayer. It's with prayer that you and I face ministry, face obstacles, face life decisions. We have to come to the Lord in prayer. And this isn't just a quick prayer. This is an ongoing kind of prayer. Not not a long prayer that you rattle off or a fancy King James only prayer. Lord, I believeth and help me to do this and all that kind of stuff. That People like to make their prayers all flowery and inauthentic sometimes but listen a a, a genuine prayer is from the heart and and it doesn't have to be wordy it doesn't have to be 30 minutes it can be 30 seconds but it's a prayer that expresses our dependency and our trust that God hears us and that we operate in his in his power and apart from him we do not operate we don't dispense the power of the Holy Spirit it dispenses us I like what was said once about 
D.L. Moody. There was a group of pastors in England, and they were wanting to pay to have D.L. Moody come and preach in their city. And finally, one of them got kind of frustrated, and they said, D.L. Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. Well, any of us can preach. And another pastor spoke up and said, yes, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. When we learn that it is God's power in us and not us, we begin to become people of prayer. It's the recipe for successful ministry. If every song is not begun with a prelude of prayer, if every sermon is not prepared in prayer and preached in prayer, if every meeting is not opened in prayer and every decision is not made with prayer, we have no power. We're thankful that it is by faith in Christ that we pray. You say, how much faith do you have to have, David? How much faith does it take? It doesn't require a mighty faith. It just requires a mustard seed faith. Just a little bit of faith was all that it takes. We have to have empty hands that we believe that only God can fill. As one preacher said, it's not the depth of our faith. It's the direction of our faith. It's not the potency of our faith. It's the person in whom we place that faith. Our prayer life is the real test of our spirituality. Think about that for a moment. Your prayer life, whatever that looks like right now, that is the determining factor of your true spiritual nature. Your spiritual life is going to be gauged by your prayer life. Now, prayerlessness is the chief cause of powerlessness. Prayerlessness is the chief cause of powerlessness. And we cannot get power into the church or into our lives until we pray. I heard a story about a organist who was getting ready to play the prelude at church. And she was getting ready to play the prelude. She put her fingers on the keys. And as she began to press the keys, there's no sound that came out. Pastor looked over very worriedly and stood up very quickly. And he said, we're going to have the service today without the organ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As he was praying, the organist looked down and she saw that the organ was unplugged. She plugged it in and she wrote a little note, put it on the pulpit. And the pastor got there, he read it. So he was trying to finish his prayer and it said, After your prayer, the power will be on. <laughs> Don't forget that after we pray, the power will be on. And, and always we, prayer brings power. We always say, you know, there's power in prayer. And, Obviously, there's really power in God. It's not the prayer, but, but we talk about power in prayer. But you're never going to experience the power of praying until you pray. I, I could talk about prayer all day long, longer than you'd want to hear. But until you realize that you have to start praying to receive the power of God, you're going to be powerless. Our church will be powerless I'm glad that the disciples learned this lesson. Because the next time we find in the book of Acts that there's a man who's begging. Peter and John say, silver and gold have we none. But in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They never had to face the accusation, but they could not again. And neither do you. Because there is power. We are dependent upon him. This morning, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I'm going to be standing here at the front, and there may be some need in your life. There's something that you are asking God to work in your life with. I'm going to ask that you'd come and that you'd kneel in prayer across this altar. Maybe you need to sit from where you're seated this morning and just pray and say, God, I want you to help me with this. I'm going to commit myself to be a person of prayer. I'm going to commit to become part of this church. I, I feel that the Lord is leading me to join with Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I want to contribute so that this would be a place of prayer. I want to encourage you to do that. And then there's a final person I want to speak to this morning. You're here this morning, and you've never received Christ as your Savior. You know that if you were to die today, that you're not right with Him. I just remind you there's two ifs in this passage. This man put an if on Jesus. He said, if you can do it. And then Jesus put a if back on him, if you'll only believe. We look at this and we consider what Jesus is saying. He says, if, because there's no if with God. God can do all things. The if is with you, if you'll only believe. 
There's another great if passage in the Bible in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And what happens if a person doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus? I'm not going to make any ands, ifs, or buts about it. The Bible says, he who believes not shall be damned. This morning you're here and you say, I want to know Jesus Christ. The if is with you. You're here and you need to pray about something. You need to make a decision. The if is with you. Will you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Would you make the decision that needs to be made as we come this morning? We stand together and respond in obedience to the Holy Spirit.